This is Green Hills in the year 2003. It's one of the housing schemes that was built as part of the new town development of East Kilbride. And with its views over Glasgow and the Campsies, Green Hills came into existence as a modern community just 30 years ago and is now home to a population of just under 9,000 people. It's a modern bustling place that has grown into a community. It has good transport links, shops, sports facilities and churches, schools and lots and lots of housing and amenities for the people who live there. And for many people that's all that Green Hills is, somewhere that sprang into life just 30 years ago and is now their home. But there's a lot more to these Green Hills than meets the eye. If you ever travel to Green Hills, the chances are that you'll drive up this road, Lake Privick Road. And Lake Privick is the starting point of our journey today because the Lake Privick name is the first name that we can associate with the area now known as Green Hills. The Lake Privicks were an ancient family well established in Scotland and in the year 1290 a charter was granted to William Lake Privick by Sir John the Red Common who was the Lord of Kilbride at the time. And this charter granted a state and lordship over the lands here, and it entitled him to receive From every plough within the lordship half a ball of oats, from all sores not having a plough a fit lot of oats, from every dwelling house a cheese made from one day's milk, and from every amerciament of court two shillings in silver. Basically, the Lake Privicks were the big boys in the area. They were the police, the judge and jury all rolled into one. And an amerciament of court was actually a fine. So the Lake Privick family used to get two shillings from each and every one of those. And in those days, there was no such thing as probation or community service. And I'll tell you another thing, you wouldn't even dare to ask the court if you could pay it up. And in this position, it's possible that the Lake Privicks would have consolidated their position by building a castle or a fortification of some kind, just to stamp their authority in the area. And indeed, there are many references on historical maps to the site of Lake Privick Castle. For example, on this map from 1654, there is a clear indication both of Green Hills and of Lake Privick Castle. But these references might not tell the full story. Nearby on the latest Ordnance Survey map is another site known locally as the High Point. Well, it's a very interesting site. Um, it just looks like a grassy lump, but uh, with a trained eye you can begin to pick up some details about how it's artificial in origin. In the past there are descriptions of it going back to the middle of the 19th century, which says it was a squarish mound um, with steep sides and about 12 yards across on the top. Now today it's only about eight yards across on the top. The sides aren't so steep and it's not so square. So what's happened in the meantime to it? Almost certainly the farmers who've had the land from the 19th century onwards have ploughed it. What we can tell from looking at what's left is that what it originally was was a raised artificial mound of earth and there's two usual interpretations, archaeological interpretations for a site like that. Which are? Well, the oldest one is a prehistoric burial mound, a barrow. Uh, and these were regularly put on high points, like we are here today, mm -hmm. where the ancestors could be buried so that they could look down on people or so that the people going about their yet everyday life could look up onto the skyline and see where Grandad was buried, so he was watching over them, keeping them safe. Other reasons that uh, artificial mounds are raised date from the medieval period, particularly after the, when the Normans came into to Scotland in the 12th and 13th centuries. And they raised up artificial mounds to form earthen timber castles. 
So this could be the earlier site of the Lichtprivik castle. On this side in particular, we have a steep slope which then goes down where it flattens off a little and then there's the steep slope formed when the path was built. Mm -hmm. Now that's not a natural landform. What that indicates is that at some time in the past people have scraped away the soil in a sort of ring, perhaps in a ditch or maybe just a quarry scoop and they've piled the stuff up in the middle. Earthen timber castles used mounds of earth that were held in place by timber walls, timber revetments, which became palisades, a, a, a wooden defensive wall. So we can imagine this as the central part of the earthen timber castle, with squarer edges going out a little further than they are just now, and surrounded by a timber wall that might have been as much as 15 or 16 foot high from the outside, but would have been much lower on the inside because we're standing on the earth, the earthworks. What happens is the, the king in, uh, in that period was trying to bring Scotland out of the so-called Dark Ages and into the mainstream of medieval uh, European culture. And part of his modernising was to bring in uh, people that, that he could know, uh, trust and who would use the modern system of government, the feudal system. Mm -hmm. um, and what he did was he introduced his, his friends, his relatives, people who he could trust powerful families and granted them lands and that was the period when you have these earth and timber fortifications coming around. There wasn't any police force or anything like that but if anyone was, was reported as doing wrong or if the, uh, the Lord's representatives, if his reeves went round and found out that somebody was doing wrong, their collar would be felt, although they wouldn't have a collar, <laughs> uh, they would be brought in and they'd be put in front of the Lord and he would uh, hear the arguments from both sides um, and then he'd dispense justice as he saw fit. I mean, it could, on serious occasions, um, it could lead to immediate death sentence. He would be kept long enough to uh, make his peace with God and then maybe strung up. Justice was swift in Green Hills at that period. The mound in the centre would have been the refuge, the defensive function, the last place you would hide, but almost always uh, that was very seldom if ever used. We're still talking about a period where coinage is very rare and most of the tenants would pay their rents in kind, they'd bring in the food that the Lord would eat and live on throughout the year. It serves the, the function of the defensive res refuge for mm -hmm. the, the lordly family. It is their residence, it's a, a mansion house, which ca castles later become, and it's also where law is, is done. So we would have buildings on either side, mm -hmm. um, the hall and solar building maybe on this side to catch the afternoon sun coming in through a, a window onto mm -hmm. the dais end, a slightly raised dais for the lord to have his uh, higher elevated role in society, maybe with uh, stables and, and stores on this side, um, inside a, a wooden palisade, but leading up to the earthen mound with its wooden wall round the outside of it um, as the, the, sort of the final military refuge, perhaps with a tower on the inside, a final watchtower or somewhere where you could get some cover while you were hiding from your enemies. So what would this um, central tower have looked like? It almost certainly would have been made of timber. There's no evidence from this site of any stonework uh, buildings, and that would be normal for the period. In the middle of the mound, there would almost certainly have been a square tower with very substantial timber posts at the corners, and the walls filled in either with wooden split log uh, panels, or maybe even with uh, more slender panels that were faced with clay that would give it a bit more protection, make it more fireproof. But given the size of this site, I think it's far more likely it would have had a, a square wooden tower, maybe two, maybe three storeys high with a, a roof to shed the rain that was mm. just as prominent then as it is now. Sure. The idea is to give you a good defensive location where you have good views all around. As you can see, it's a very prominent location. That's why it might have been a prehistoric burial site. If you think about it, if I'm attacking 
irate neighbour thinks you've stolen his cattle, sends the boys round to raid your castle. They have to come in to a steep slope, they're already tired from climbing up the natural hill slope, and suddenly they're faced with not just you standing above me, but a wooden wall rising up maybe 14 or 15 feet, with you at the top in cover behind a wooden palisade, ready to chuck stones at them, shoot a crossbow, shoot arrows, or throw spears at them. They have to get to the bottom of the wall, put a ladder up, try and attack you from that. Great defensive position. Little sites like this could be defended by half a dozen men against 50 or 60. So it's a very, very easy way of raising a very defensive refuge. I think we're at the edge of it roundabout yeah. now. And we would be walking round now. It may be that they, they ditched into the, the hillside, but we would expect to see a little hollow where there was a ditch. You see them in other sites in the East Kilbride area where there's a slight hollow where natural erosion and ploughing has filled in the ditch. There's no sign of it here, so it's possible all they did was just scrape into the hillside, what's called scarping in, to quarry out enough material to pile up in the middle. Yeah. So you would have like a, well, like the hat I'm wearing, you scarp into the hillside and then you have the Absolutely. motto on top. We know it's man-made, the question is, when was it made and for what purpose? And I think the most likely explanation is it's the earthen timber castle, the predecessor to the later Lickprivik. So, it could have been an ancient burial ground. It could have been the site of an earthen timber castle. People might even have been hanged and flogged here. But I'll tell you something, whatever it was in the past, you still got one heck of a view. Even though there was a family of nobility here 700 years ago, not everyone had their own castle to live in. In fact, in these early days of the 21st century, it's difficult to imagine what life would have been like back in the Middle Ages. But to help us with this part of our journey today, David Ross, a historian and well-known author, took us shopping to illustrate the differences between our lives and theirs. Look at the shops we've got here. We've got a butcher's, a baker's, there's a post office, there's a supermarket. You've got clothes shops. Um, when you compare that to how life would have been in the late medieval period in this area, completely different. Uh, people had to grow their own food, barter for food. In a good year, you would hopefully have an excess, and it's that excess that you would use. If you, um, you managed to have a good crop of corn, for instance, you could use the excess corn that you had to trade someone else for whatever they had an excess of, etc. And uh, money, apart from the, the churchmen and nobility and basically royalty in Scotland, money was a fairly unknown quantity in Scotland right up to maybe just 100, 200 years ago. The feudal system uh, was a bit like the idea that people have were pyramid selling is concerned because you've got royalty right at the top of the pyramid coming down into the great lords and then the lairds underneath and then down to the, the peasants and the, um, the ordinary farm workers under that. And um, what you would have had in Greenhills, for instance, would have, there would have been a, a lord based at like Privet Castle. He would have been in charge of the peasantry around here and they were very much tied to the land. The, the chances of bettering yourself or, or educating yourself was very, very slim. Um, and so these people basically gave a certain amount of their produce to the landowner any excess from that would be used to feed their family and if they could get anything above that then that could be used for, for um, what to us would be very minor things today but luxuries to them. Salt for instance. Salt was a, a very sought after commodity mm -hmm. and uh, people would basically have given their eye teeth for a packet of salt like that. Not just for flavour because of course food was pretty bland. The word bland actually comes from a food that, that people ate in medieval times in Scotland. That they actually ate something called bland that was bland. So to have any sort of seasoning the likes of salt and pepper and things like that. But not just for um, flavour and food. The other, the other thing about salt was of course there was no refrigerators in these days. And if you had meat for instance the only way to keep it fresh was to salt it. And so salt was very very sought after. But um, your average person that lived here even a couple of hundred years ago to walk in here and look at this would just be flabbergasted that, to, to know that you could walk into a shop and just pick up goods such as these. Because all this, I mean, this has obviously been prepared and things, but uh, we've got joints of beef and sausages and stuff like that. Meat to commoners back then, what would it have been like? Well, the thing was, if someone was lucky enough to 
to be able to shoot a deer with a bow and arrow or whatever. They would use every single part. You know, this is all done for us in this day and age, in medieval times. You would have used everything, the offal, the, the intestines would have been used for something. You would use everything. And of course the skin would be used to, yeah. to make clothing, etc. So you, there was no part went to waste. Something as every day as toothache. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as if you could go to the, the dentist and, and get an injection, get a tooth pulled or mm -hmm. filled. Um, there'd probably be somebody um, in the area that shoot horses that would also pull teeth for a small right? fee. I use the same pair of pliers as well, you know. Oh. But um, I mean, an aspirin. I mean, to have a headache and be able to take an aspirin. I mean, that's that's things that it's most basic. But there would be nothing. But the mortality rate, of course, was very very high because there was no way of. of uh, stemming diseases and things like that. In this, this day and age, I think we take the likes of drugs and chemists very much for, for granted. If you think of what it would have been like to get a, a leg break, for instance, in this day and age, you go to hospital and get it set, very rough and ready then. I think that there'd have been an awful lot of deformities in the ordinary people. I think if you were to go back in time and just look, I think that one in every three or four uh, people that you saw just in the country lanes would probably have a deformed arm or, or a withered leg or something just from prior injuries. I mean look at the centrally heated double glazed. In the old days it would just have been basically the tough cabins uh -huh. with the sort of thatched roofs. Um, people would have brought their animals in believe it or not in the winter months and they would have lived in one half of the house with the people in the other. <laughs> that was their way of, of having central heat and the animals would be in one half of the house and fenced off from the rest of the family because of the heat that uh, the likes of a cow gives off etc. It would be a bit smelly but then as long as it kept you warm you know I think that's more than what people were worried about. And uh, windows were basically, they wouldn't have any glazing in their windows, nothing like the double glazing today so they would just simply have stri uh, strips of material hanging to cover the window to keep out the worst of the wind and rain. Electricity I mean, people in East Kilbride today, I mean, kids can't really grasp that two generations ago there wasn't any electricity here. I, mean, I know, right underneath a lamppost. Yeah. But it's that way that um, no PlayStations, no televisions. Basically, when it got dark, you went to your bed. There was nothing much else to do. Life has changed so hugely, you know, and, and here, I mean, where we were standing, people stood 500 years ago and, and they would never have been able to envisage these changes. It's quite flabbergasting, really, when you look at it like that. Man rent was the thing. And by man rent, basically the word self-explanatory. Um, because you were granted areas of ground by the local lord, he also owned the able-bodied men aged between 16 and 60 in what was called man rent. If you were an ordinary peasant, an ordinary resident of Greenhill, so to speak, at that time, in other words, if uh, the lord wanted you to go and fight, you were expected to fight if you lived on his land. Similar to how we see the clan system in this day and age, but it existed here as well. And in the likes of Wallace's time and Bruce's time, when Bruce said to his great earls, right, we need to raise an army, they would go to the lairds, like the laird that looked perfect, and he would muster up all the able-bodied men between 16 and 60, and they would ex be expected to go and fight. Well, a lot of the villagers would only be bringing simple things like, um, basically, scythes, uh, clubs, so they've got basically farming implements. If not, they go to war fighting with their clothes that they work in, they sleep in, they drink, they eat, everything in. They go to war with these clothes on. That is the whole idea of a Wapham show. They will gather there and assemble at a certain time. They've been told a week on Sunday after Kirk, you be here. They will come to this lands and then we'll have a good look at these men. And from there, we will assess. We'll sort out the weak from the strong. We will sort out the good people from the bad people. We will sort out the people I want to fight for me in battle and assess what weapons they've got and how best that we can utilise them. Well, there'll be tradesmen, there'll be sutlers, uh, you know, armourers coming to sell their wares, uh, sutlers coming to try and sell you a new knife, cordwainers making shoes and stuff like this, trying to sell you a new pair of shoes, repair your shoes, all for a price. So it's like a market, but it's on the move. And these people march with the army, and these people make money from the armies. Well, the women, the camp followers actually were there to service the camp, pure and simple. A woman knows a place in medieval Scotland, and that is doing chores for men. They cook, they sew, they maybe want to do some carving and stuff, they repair any things that need to repair. Some women would even be looking after and polishing the armour, even though the squires are there to do it. So the women are actually given jobs. These women are following the camps also in the hope of some pay. We'd send out, you know, foragers who are looking also to find out, you know, best place, we camp near a river, we need fresh water, of course. We're also looking to get, you know, a good defensive position, as well as a position we can go and attack from. So we go with our intelligence. 
We try and find out how many men we're going to attack. We try and find out what their strategic position is and how best we can attack it. And then, of course, we just simply trudge the battle. I'll get my men lined up in an even battlefield, an even plain field, if you like. I'll line my men up, we'll have all their arms by their sides, and they go with the commands of me and my commanders, commanding both sides. These people will be tense, they'll be a wee bit nervous. They're going to try and fight someone and kill someone they don't even know. Someone they might even have something in common in, i.e. they're poor, their enemy's poor. It's awful, it's absolutely awful, it's terrifying. There's mass confusion. Um, you're fighting one person, you can end up fighting a person on your own team as well, on your side. There's weapons flying around, you can get hit by someone who's fighting a completely different person. There's long pole, ar pole arms getting swung around to actually try and hit your enemy. This might go for, of course, injure your arm, but still, take your leg off. So there's mass confusion, it's bloody, it's hot, it's uncomfortable, and it's terrifying. It would be noisy as well to add to the confusion. It's a horrible place, the battlefield. But there is a bonus, these people can get plunder from the battlefield there. These people might see a decent pair of shoes that their enemy is wearing. And a dead enemy's shoes are no good to a dead enemy, so they'll take them off. These people might get some pieces of jewellery, you know, a new coat, a piece of armour example. It was a way of furthering yourself to a certain extent, although obviously the opposite end of the coin is death. But it was ordinary people. And I think this is what people in this day and age don't get to grips with, is the fact that the men who fought with Wallace, the men who fought with Bruce, etc., well, just punters. They, they are the direct descendants of these people and of course people from this area. People I think when they think of Green Hills don't think about it in the big entity of Scotland's history. But the men who made up the battle armies were just the ordinary punters from areas like this. So, life was pretty harsh back in those times. Scrabbling to grow a bit of food on a wee strip of land in the morning, getting a chap at your door in the afternoon to be called off to war. And if you were really lucky, making it back in the evening with a little bit of plunder for your family, just in time to crawl into bed beside the sheep and the cows that you shared your cottage with. But hey, one thing, at least they never had any money worries. But that was only because they never had any money. I was really taken by this idea of barter though and trading for goods, so I thought I would put it to the test in the Greenhouse pub by going in and buying everyone a drink. Is one a drink? Right, absolutely, that's fine. Right, get them all a drink. <laughs> right, well, I've got a nice bit of cheese there, Rena. I've got a bag of potatoes, oats, oats, I can't forget the oats, and there's some lovely turnips in there and a wee leek. Justice is still swift in Green Hills. I think I'll just take my wallet next time, it's a lot easier. But what about the Link Privet family? I'm sure with their wealth, they never had any money worries and were continuing to prosper in the area in the Middle Ages. Now Hugh, all the historical records and the OS maps talk about the site of the Lick Privet Castle actually being here. So why have we come from the high point down to here? What would have happened? Well, it's likely that they shifted the site of the castle. One of the main reasons is related to the weather. Well, I can tell you something, as a Greenhouse resident, everyone that lives here will appreciate the reasons about the weather. It's a very windy place. The reason we're standing here is because in the 19th century, when the first accurate maps of the area were being made, the Ordnance Survey map makers spoke to people who could point out on the ground, mm -hmm. oh yes, that field there, that corner of that field, is where the castle was. And they pointed out this area. And ever since the 1850s, Ordnance Survey maps have recorded where we're standing just now as the site of Lick Privet Castle. This area around here, this just flat area, uh -huh. is where the castle would have been. Um, it's harder to tell nowadays with the houses in the way, but we have a flat, flat surface uh, before the hill goes up on that side. And on this side, we have the quarry down there. Uh, the 19th century map showing a quarry close to the castle, maybe where the, the stone, mm. some of the stone for the mm. castle came from. The historical documents refer to it standing on a, a slight prominence, a rocky knoll um, in the general area. Um, and again, it's difficult to see nowadays with the, the housing of green hills around us exactly what it was like. But you can see that we're rising uphill, like Privic Road coming up behind us. Um, there's a slight hollow here, and we've got a flat area. So the topography, the lie of the land, suits the description we have of the site of the castle. We know that the descriptions talk about it having towers and battlements, and we know the class of 
castellated residence that was common um, in the later medieval period. Mm -hmm. We can imagine a stone version of what went before, an enclosing wall in Scots that would be a barmkin, a barmkin enclosure. Um, and inside that, there would have been a number of buildings. One would have been the preeminent pre uh, building which takes the place of the, the hall. It might have been a hall and solar type building in stone. It may have had two or more stories. It may have been a tower form, uh, but it would have had castle-like features, the battlements round the top um, and narrow slit windows at ground floor level, probably with a vaulted basement, perhaps with the, the kitchen in the uh, the ground floor or the first floor, or perhaps again with a separate kitchen building. There would again have been stables and again stores. You get a certain amount of stores in the vaulted ground floor of the castle, the main residence, but you would have needed other stores as well. The tower would have been a, a statement, so they would want the window surrounds and the door surrounds and the corner stones of the building to be built in freestone. Uh, sandstone would be most, most usual. Um, but limestone, if it was available within the, the castle's lands, uh, would have been used. And they would have been finely dressed stones to give it a, a, a nice sharp, clean edge around the, the windows and doors and the corners. But the bulk of the walls would have been built of what's called random uh, rubble construction, mortared rubble, um, almost like a, a crazy paving. People are used to seeing this without knowing what it is. And very, very thick walls, maybe six, seven, eight feet thick, with two skins on the outside and then more rubble filled in with mortar to make up, make up the bulk of the wall. And the bulk of that rubble infill would have been less easily shaped stone like whinstone. Um, and it's likely that the quarry around here would have been a whinstone quarry. But once the weather starts getting in, then you're in big trouble. So the idea was to keep the weather out for as long as possible. Um, and that was largely down to the roof construction. And the reason we have so few of these buildings around is that the roof was usually uh, stripped off uh, when the building went out of use. Um, and once the timbers were taken off to be re reused elsewhere, then the weather would get into the top of the walls and soak down through that rubble core and basically weakens the whole structure and it starts to collapse. From the auspicious beginnings, the fortunes of the Lickprivick family seem to be changing. Over the next few centuries, the Register of Saisines in Edinburgh notes that some of the lands were being traded and eventually sold on to the Duke of Hamilton's estate. And although a Robert Lickprivick became a printer to the court of the king in 1568, the name and the family were losing their hold in the area. In fact, in David Ewer's history of Rutherglen and East Kilbride from 1793, he notes that... The title with profits belongs at present to Torrance. The greatest part of the estate is the property of John Boy's Esquire. The last person of the name I could hear of in this part of the country died a few years ago in Straven, and the castle of Lickprivick was about 60 years ago reduced to ruins and nothing remains now but some scattered rubbish. Now, sometimes they're sold off for scrap. And really? you send, yeah, you sell that the, the lordly family wouldn't seem to be quite so attached to their uh, forefather's residence and they'd sell the building to a scrap merchant. So this is a medieval version of a car boot sale? It's recycling. The ownership was passing on and the use of the land in greenhills was changing. The industrial revolution was taking place and local industries were starting. In the 18th century, the parish of Kilbride became a centre for shoemaking, with cordwainers supplying shoes to the public and to the army, with a considerable number being used during the Crimean War. Then, towards the end of the 1700s, along came the Wabsters, and weaving took over as the main occupation. Other industries, like limestone mining, were also in existence, with mines at Lime Kilns, Murray Hill, and in the Green Hills area itself, although the quality of the limestone from this mine wasn't of the same quality as some of the other local mines. In fact, there was even some coal mining at Lickprivick too. In 1790, there were 14 miners employed, and in 1840, the coal they mined was being sold in the village for four shillings and sixpence for 12 hundredweights although the better quality canvas lang coal was being sold for eight shillings and eightpence for 1,600 weights. 
The reserves of coal, though, were not extensive, and it's likely that the mining at Litprivik finished fairly soon after, because after 1850, abandonment plans of any mine had to be registered with the coal board, and they have no records of the mine at Litprivik. In one way, though, this might have been a blessing, because very soon, vast areas of Lanarkshire were being cut open, and the men of Lanarkshire descended into the bowels of the earth to dig out the coal which would fuel the ever-increasing industrial revolution. And behind them, they left vast amounts of waste and piles of debris that scarred the countryside for countless decades to come. Early in the 20th century, though, the Greenhills area was mostly working farms, High and low white hills, or the Whittles, as they were called, Green Hills, or the Grunnels, as it became known, West Netherton, and in 1920, very near the high point, the first seat of power for the Lake Privick family, North and South Lake Privick farms came into the ownership of the Allison family. Oh, well, I was born here, so that's, you know, that's the only home I knew. And, well, my grandfather came there, obviously. So I take it my father was born there as well. I was not any different for another house, really. You know, it's just a house. Uh, well, kitchen, living room was all in the one, you know, and just your know, four bedrooms. Unfortunately, the farmhouses at Lake Privick no longer exist, but John Reardon, who worked for the Allisons many years ago, took us on a journey to the Greenhill Shopping Centre to show us just exactly where Lake Privick Farm had been. What I remember about the place, and I, I wish I had taken photographs really, but I'm quite positive sure that North Lake Privick would just have sat about the corner of the buildings there. And I would say that South, South Lake Privick was probably just down a wee bit on the left-hand side of the road. And just before where the, the steading sat, he just went round and there was a bend in the road and that bend in the road is still there. Before the bend of the road, the silage pit sat here. That's when they, they started the making silage, when they, they, they went away for the traditional crops and they started growing silage and it was a big deep pit built here. And this, I would say this is just about where it was. Now, whether those trees were in front of the garden or whether they've disappeared or no, but you're no far away. Because I can always remember when you just left the farm up there and you come down, you were just quite close to this bend in the road. John Reardon wasn't our only detective for these lost farms. Kenny Kennedy, who used to work for the Smiley family on West Netherton Farm when he was a teenager, has great memories of his time there and where the farmhouse was. My association with Netherton Farm probably started when we moved to East Cobrine when I was about seven. And there was nothing between our house and this farm, just the country road. So we would come up here at the weekends and this is where my mother would buy our milk and our eggs from Peggy Smiley just at the door of the farm. The only out of the farmyard as I remember it seemed to be as you came in the, down the driveway or the entrance to the farm you'd turn round left into the yard which would be somewhere in this area here and on the left hand side you had a couple of bothies, um, a tractor store and then the entrance to the house was in the corner possibly where we are standing right now. The building ran along this way with the entrance to the dairy and you get through the dairy into the byre which would be at the back there. Down to this side you had another couple of wee sheds, kept pigs in them and then there was some chicken houses and between those you would have went round and there was a huge slurry pit round there in the corner. Where we're standing just about now would have been behind the main farm and its buildings and its byre and just probably almost where we are at this house here was the barn of a hayloft, which was a huge corrugated iron structure. Other farmers were also working in the area. Bob Wiseman, the founder of Wiseman's Dairy, moved to High White Hills with his family back in the 1920s. And Bob was only 17 when his father died, and that meant he had to take over the running of the farm at a very young age. We came to High White Hills in 1923, and we built, built High White Hills, I think it was about the they paid about eighteen hundred pounds for it. That was a, a ninety-six acre of it, and uh, there was a bond. Of, I think it was a bond of seven hundred pounds on it, and that was for nineteen twenty-three till. Well, I must have been. I must have been up to just before, but nineteen thirty-six. I we paid it off, and I remember taking it up. And the lawyer was so pleased that I did. We'd done so well getting the, the bond. Uh -huh. 
Well, the house was just, it was a, what you see, maybe a one and a half story. There was the, the floor and then there was the attic, attics up above, which just had skylights into them. And then a winter's night, you can't, you could, you could wait in the morning with snow lying in the top of your blankets. Uh -huh. But you were still quite comfortable. You didn't have an inside bathroom at that time when we were kids. It came later and there was an extension put on me, an extra bedroom in the sitting room and that. You're really under the one roof, is the same as the cattle. Another end of the, the, the dwelling house was the stable where the horses was. You could always hear the horses during the night. If anything was wrong, you could hear them going on. Mm -hmm. That's what it was like. And there was no inside toilet, of course. She was, the toilet was out in the mid and heed. And it was... Well, I suppose you must get used to it. It was damn cold, I can do. <laughs> One thing all these farms had in common was that they were all dairy farms. And one thing all the farmers had in common was that farming is very hard work. Well, in the morning you got up and they, and my first thing you did was milk the cows and then you fed the other animals. It's just if you've got a lot of cows, you spend all day, somebody says you put it in one end and take it out the other, and that's what you spend your whole day doing. Well, with cows, well, these days it was all hand milked and it was cooled. It's better than what we call a cooler. In the milk cows, the, the way they cooled the milk, there was an iron stand and there was a, a half moon pan and there was a thing like, like an old washing board, ribbed, but inside there was a, tubes for cold water and that ran through, then there was a trough, well the milk come through that pan, run down each side of that and it was been cooled, then there was a wee trough with a hole in it and it run down into the can, so You'll see these cans are all marked 1 to 10 gallon. These were 10 gallon cans. The evening's milk and morning's milk were all outside for the lorry coming in and they were all taken by lorry. And away back there was a, a creamery in East Kilbride at Park Hall Street. It was a cooperative and that's where most of the milk would go at that time, you know, from the farms here. When the man left his ear milk, he left here the four or five cans, whatever you need. So we pick them up and come back up again. That was an end. Depends what the time of the day. If it was good, hard frosty, one to the weather, you'd be awake here and dung. Uh -huh. And of course, in the summer time, you'd be working at seed time, uh, thinning turnips or hoeing potatoes. No doubt you saw the, the tractors and these big machines going along cutting the hedges, the roadsides. That's what they cut the hedges in the olden days. That's a hedge knife. And it, 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 was, known as, it was known as a whittle. And that was the, the kind of action. And that's, that's what they used for cutting the hedges way back in the old days. One of the wee duties we used to always have to do as well was to collect the eggs. Um, and because they were free range hens, they weren't just always in the hen house, the eggs. They'd be sort of all over the place. You'd know there'd be nooks and crannies to look in. One place in particular I remember was the hedge row right along Old West Nelton Road. Um, under the old beach hedges, you would see the small hollowed areas where the hens had sat and laid. And sure enough, there'd be three or four eggs. You would collect them, carry on along the hedgerow, looking for them till you knew you had checked every wee bit where they used to lay and take all those back to the farm as well. It could taste so green, you'd plough it up. And it was a pair of horses I was working with at that time to begin with. And you followed them up and down the park. And it was a long, boring job, really. Well, we, I, we didn't think it hard at the time, but you look back and it, it was hard, aye, huh? I mean, the price of animals at that time, I mean, you'd have got a good milk cow for £20. Uh -huh. You could even get them kind of in the teens of pounds, you know. We, I remember going to Lanark, that was a day, buying two heifers for less than £30. It's unbelievable nowadays. And black-faced sheep, you could buy them at four and six pence each. Lambs, huh? Yeah, I've got a pricey about the whiskey was twelve and six, <laughs> and my father thought that was ridiculous because in his days it was only half a crown. <laughs> right, so where we're standing at the moment, uh, this wee field here, and that was the quarry field. Now, sometimes when there were excess of cattle, they had to outwinter some of the young beasts because there wasn't enough room in the byres or loose boxes. So, what they did. They wintered them and they sheltered in the quarry there. Oh, well, we didn't have much hobbies in these days. And I remember when we were boys, my brother Joe and I were in a great collection of glass and bowls, you know. 
So we thought we'd go and bury some of them. It's quite far too many. So we'd be a bag each. I went away doing it the pizza somewhere. And we'd bury them. We could never find them again. So they must be, they must be lying there yet. <laughs> The greenhouse farm has also disappeared. It's now the site of Greenhouse Primary School. But not all the farms have gone. One farm does still exist, although not as a working farm. Well, not unless you class drinking as work. Background to East Coast Bride is really quite simple. Read it in the Herald one day that East Coast Bride Development Corporation were looking for somebody to develop what was uh, the last example of East Coast Bride's farming heritage. Prior to that, they had bulldozed all the farms. So we had to look at it and decided it would make a nice public house, which is what they were asking us to do. 1977, September or thereby, there was no roofs on any of it, all the gables were down. It had been on fire about six or seven times. If you can visualise a building that has fallen in on itself, the floors are no longer there, all the stuff from the ceiling, the roof, etc. is all lying inside. So we were trying to save the slates, we were trying to save everything that we could lay our hands on because we were going to obviously reuse it. Uh, once we had cleaned the inside out, then we had to start scurrying around trying to find things that we could use again. Uh, all the slates that are on this building at the moment came from Shield Hall. They came from the cooperative uh, bottling plant down there. So there's a lot of stuff in there that's pretty old now. <laughs> the main headache was you couldn't find um, an appropriate main contractor to come and do this kind of work because this was a, a renovation and a renovation is totally different from a greenfield site. It has to be a very much a hands-on operation. Uh, you're directing, say, uh, one joiner, one plumber, one electrician, uh, possibly two labourers. So I had two uh, lads from Vietnam who did not speak any English at all, and it was all sign language, and they were the best labouring people I've ever come across. They worked hard, they worked very hard, but everything was a very much a hands-on, seven days a week operation. It was difficult, but we completed the job in about 12 months. We opened the place as a public house in September of 1979. Uh, from there, it was 1981 when we opened up what is the, the, was the function suite in those days. Now, the only thing I know of the history was basically what we discovered after we came on site. Uh, the farm the farm was owned latterly by Agnes Coates, relative of the uh, Paisley Thread people. Uh, when she died in 1965, um, East Cobride Development Corporation took the property over by compulsory purchase. But the Coates family weren't the last occupants of the White House farm before the Hart brothers bought it and converted it into a pub. The corporation had leased the farm to a man called Jerry Hodgson back in the 70s. Jerry in turn leased one of the barns to a riding school and Jerry himself converted the cowshed into an experimental theatre. Local actress Cathy Carney was a member of the East Kilbride Repertory Company at the time and she remembers what it was like. Because we had heard about it in the rep and people like the Opera Club and all that, it became a kind of venue for us to come to. And the thing, as I said before, it was like a party after a show. I got involved because my wife was at that time in the Light Opera Club and Jerry was in the Light Opera Club and he said one night, would you like to come back to my place and we're going to start a mag magical singing group, which is sort of unusual. So I, um, I answered, oh yeah, and she, she was a singer, so she was, she was keen to go and I was a, I was a hanger on, so I, I, I came along. It was like an old farm barn. You wouldn't expect it to be, you know, very posh or anything like that. And they had wooden planks and funny seats and old chairs and everything. It was, it was remarkable, but it was the atmosphere of the place. For people like ourselves, it was super, absolutely lovely. Was and there was a few drinks went around. Well, we ne never anything very formal. If anybody would remember the wee barn theatre in St Andrews, it was rather like that. You didn't expect to put a big production on. The entrance to the theatre was this area here. This was a door. So in the old days when the cows were coming in here, this was ramped up with, the, with all the stalls for the cows. At the far end up there, they had a theatre, a stage. So those and such as those that came in obviously sat in amongst all these funny little stalls, which frankly <laughs> probably were not unlike that sort of shape there. 
you know, people sitting in with their sandwiches and paints or whatever the heck it was. But the, the, the stage was at the other end. And it was the kind of thing where it would be like, two people would be cracking jokes and then somebody would play a guitar and, and we would sing and maybe, maybe just occasionally a wee bit of a play, no, not, not a full length thing, but something like a wee sketch. And we liked it because it was another place to display your talents, which at that time, there wasn't very much of that here. No time at all we were involved in folk singing and theatre and madrigals, and it was tremendous. At that time, I used to sing um, all these old, uh, my old man says, follow the van, and I used to, that was my repertoire at the time. And she would do Pirandello and uh, Pinter, um, Schaefer, Baldwin, there would be lots of um, 60s, 50s and 60s playwrights. Um, and it was very, very suited to this for small groups. <laughs> Joshua, Joshua, why don't you come and see Papa? That kind of thing. And plenty of booze, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and with a little bit of a drink, it's amazing how the tongue would be loosened. So, Green Hills are experimental theatre too. But not only that, can you believe that this place used to be a favourite holiday destination for people from all over the country? You see, as well as being working farms, the farmers used to earn a wee bit more money by leasing their fields out to people who wanted to build holiday huts there. And not only holiday huts, they had a swimming pool, they had tennis courts and even a golf course. So if you don't mind, I'm off to find out if they had a 19th hole at this golf course. I was born in the West End of Glasgow in Scotland and uh, my father and my sister and I used to come to Lut Privick in the late 40s and early 50s because my aunt had a, a railway carriage which was a holiday home which was in, in the Lut Privick next to a burn. Just beyond the, the high point, well it's a wee bit beyond it, and I was 30, 30, 30, 32 huts in the top. I was about six or seven and my brother had bought this hut and they put it up in the country to get away from Glasgow. And we spent from Easter till October, every weekend, and then in the summer when we were near at school, we came up and had our summer holidays up here until it was our holiday time, and we went to Millport for our fortnight. Well, Tom, my husband, came here as a boy with a group of people from Glasgow and they were looking for a nice country atmosphere because people who lived in the city would always want to do that. You know what it's like. Anyway, someone or an uncle of his found out there was a farm called Wilson's Farm and Wilson's Farm had a field that they were willing to give these people. Oh, just all shapes and sizes, yeah. Railway carriages. We had some man who was telling like two kind of big horse carriage things, you know, four wheeled things. Of course, these were men who were used to working with their hands and artisans and people like that. And they created these lovely little houses. Well, the carriages were very comfortable. They were sort of sectioned off so that you would have maybe a couple of little bedrooms and, and a nice uh, kitchen area and the place where they all sat. But one of them in particular was kept as a social place so they could have these playing cards and things that people did before the television hit the road, you know. And they really, the children loved that. But they had football for the men. Everything was for the men. They had football, they had golf, uh, they had tennis, they had table tennis. What would happen is that uh, a weekend or a week during the summer, we would get the bus from the Broomalaw and uh, we would be stacked up there with homemade jam and bread and all the provisions to last you for the week and uh, we got in the broom of an old sugarly bus and it used to struggle up the hill at East Bay because the road was very twisty and, and uh, very hilly in these days. And then they would have to walk all that way up that hill. And gosh, I don't know how they managed it because my mother-in-law would be in her own with two children. And we'd walk from the cross the village all the way to the Privic to the hut and you got there and then you get and the eats and all the rest of it, the shoes off and you run about just with your, your shorts and your vest on and have a great time. And then you'd go to the farm and you'd get fresh eggs and milk and things like that. And you just lived a country life and, and it really was great fun. We had the sticky bun, what we called the sticky bun. And it was a, a spring that used to keep it full. And you used to get f frogs and 
baby frogs and my daughter, she was only two, and she collected some frogs and my mother had come up. My mother was sitting in the chair and she came and she put all these frogs in my mother's lap. Well, my mother was like me, small, stout, and you should have seen her, she just about had a fit <laughs> with all these frogs. The farmer used to ask the children to come and help him on the farm. And I don't know if any child now would ever appreciate a glass of milk and a homemade scone like they did. But Tom used to say, oh, that at the end of a day, when you were working in the fields, that was your payment, and it was lovely. I think it was special because uh, really you get out of the city, and it was also, it, it, probably like all children in some respects, probably no different today, you got your dad to yourself for the whole week or, or the period you were together, and that was, you were spoiled rotten because your dad was there. That was your hero in your life, wasn't it? So I think probably that's one of the big special things, but it was also the adventure, because the day was long because you were up at the crack of dawn, you were out there in the country enjoying everything that was going on and you obviously went to bed at night completely shattered and looking for a good night's sleep. And because there was such a lot of children, there was always a great deal of them to be able to, you know, sort of enjoy each other's company. And they made, they made a lot of friends and... Uh, but I think really the, the adults were very conscious of the fact that the children needed to have something to entertain them. One of my funniest stories, which I always remember, was once uh, carrying on with my cousins and my dad, and I stepped backwards and I tripped, and I sat in the cows dropping, and I was covered in cows uh, dropping from top to bottom, and they just took me out and put me in a barrel of water and washed me in freezing cold water, and he just accepted that, that was life. But I think the indignity of everybody was laughing at me, and that was, I, always, I, can, I can remember that quite clearly in my mind, you know, as a wee boy. Well, I spent my honeymoon up here. I got married in Glasgow, because I came from Glasgow, and we had this uh, limousine to take us up to Skirray, but we told the, the driver to go to the farm before he turned. But unfortunately, he didn't. There was a bend in the road, and he thought he could turn the car there. But he went into the ditch, and he broke his axle. So he had to stay in the taxi all night till somebody came up in the road and get him. But we didn't know this. It's a good thing we didn't. <laughs> I remember my auntie Nell gave me a two pound pot of strawberry jam, and I was standing at the broom of law, and my dad had given me this, my only duty was to carry this two pound pot of strawberry jam all the way to the Privic and I dropped it and broke it. And, uh, and I remember, I can, I can still remember to this day looking down at the cobbles at the broom of law with a broken jam and looking up at my father, looking at me with a bit of disgust and it uh, still rings in my head to this day. So that's probably my saddest moment, losing two pounds of strawberry jam. So that weekend you never got any pieces up at Lake Privet? <laughs> that's right, need jam, need jelly pieces, no, <laughs> need jelly pieces, that's it. But East Kilbride as a small village and holiday destination was about to change drastically. Just after the Second World War, the government wanted to encourage regeneration. The plan for East Kilbride started way back in uh, 1946 under the, the, the New Towns Planning Act and East Kilbride came into being in 1947 because around about the same time just after the war, the Glasgow Corporation started to build uh, you know, the big corner basins like uh, Castle Mill, Drumchapel, Easter House. Under the guidance of Sir Patrick Dolan, the East Kilbride Development Corporation was formed and they moved into Torrance House to start planning and building a new town. Their idea was to provide a carefully planned town with good road and transport links, self-contained communities and facilities for both work and leisure. There was also a great need for modern housing which would accommodate the new workers for all the new industry that was being attracted to the town. Over the next two decades, companies like Rolls-Royce Engineering and clothing manufacturers like Laird Porch moved into large, purpose-built industrial estates. East Kilbride was a new town with new jobs and new people. The idea was to take that to a population of 50,000 people. That was the intention. And with government departments like the Inland Revenue at Centre One becoming big employers in the new town, the corporation announced plans for even more housing, this time on the site of Lick Privick Farm. And before you knew it, the new Green Hills had been named and was being planned. There were overspill uh, agreements signed with the East Coast Development Corporation and Glasgow Corporation. And right around about the time Green Hills was built, there was another uh, agreement done to take in a thousand people from Glasgow. So the first building work got underway, but not where you might have thought. 
Bill Niven, one of our local historians, was actually the provost of East Kilbride at the time, and he took us to an area now known as White Hills. September 1970, that's almost 33 years ago, and we were just about to start off the Green Hill scheme, which was eventually to be about 3,500 houses and 10,000 people. The first sod was cut here. We had a, in that spot there, we had a, a JCB. So the, with the JCB driver, we cut the first sod there. Over there, where that block of flats is, that was in fact a, a long row of pipes which were here to build the, the drainage and the roads for the first cutting of green hills. In all directions but north it was green fields. There were the six or eight farms of, of, of the green hills area. And down here, of course, was the edge of the Murray. The Murray had come up to where the, the pub down there is, the Stroud. And um, this was all green fields. There was nothing here in 1970. Then there was a, a slight hiatus before the rest of green hills began to, to move. Oddly enough, although most of the houses in East Kilbride up to, from 1947 until 1995 were built by the Development Corporation, but this is one of the very few East Kilbride Borough Council sites. Uh, and that's probably why you see a slight differentiation in the architecture of the houses. But it's very much part of Green Hills? Very much part of Green Hills. I moved into Green Hills. It wasn't White Hills. White Hills was, there was a White Hills farm. Our, my living room window looked over to White Hills Farm, but it was actually Green Hills 1 was our postal address, and I lived in 94 Ballarat Terrace, and I moved in in May 1971. A couple of years later, to my disappointment, because I always felt quite pleased that I was the first person ever in Green Hills, uh, the, there was a big publicity campaign, you know, saying about uh, the first house, the first tenants moving into Green Hills, and that was in True Avenue. But in actual fact, they'd forgotten us. They'd forgotten about us down in White Hills, or Green Hills One. After the Borough Council building Green Hills One, the Development Corporation took on the majority of the building work, and they looked outside for firms to fulfil the contracts. What happened with the building of the town? Um, all building contracts went out to tender, and that uh, in Green Hills uh, the one of the main builders within East Kilbride was uh, Wilson's of Stonehouse. We started building the, the Green Hills scheme in September 1971. Well, the housing types we were building um, were basically um, two, three, four bedroomed houses, uh, usually in terraces, and uh, one, two and three bedroom flats. To build a typical house um, at that time, uh, basically, I would have suggested, uh, you know, anywhere between six and nine months from the start. Again, the vision for Green Hills, it really was, you know, modern housing, uh, good quality housing, uh, pl plenty of green, green, you know, green space, lots of landscaping, some place that you could really be proud to come in and live in. When it came to naming the streets, a new code devised by Mr P Kemp Burt of the District Council was actually pioneered in Green Hills. The term road was kept to the distributor roads like Lake Privet, Green Hills and Stroud. Unit distributors would be called streets, avenues or drives. And access roads to houses would be Crescent, Grove, Court, Terrace or Place. They would take an area and provide the area with the names of golf courses like North Berwick or St Andrews or the like, or Bird Sandpiper, or Trees, Alder etc, Poplar. It was the Borough of East Kilbride and, and I think I was involved in this. And as well as the Provost Bill Niven suggesting golf courses, Councillor Mrs Brady picked the idea of trees for other parts of Green Hills. The houses were being built, the streets were being named, and the people were moving in. But it wasn't all plain sailing. As the building work got underway, Lake Privet Farm, which was still standing and being used as a storage facility for fire lighters, was burnt down. And something that was happening in the outside world was to have a massive impact on the construction of Green Hills. The biggest problem was the oil price um, a hike in the, in the 1973-74, a time when prices of um, materials in particular in the construction business uh, literally doubled uh, overnight. Timber, for example, which is a commodity we use extensively, uh, doubled virtually overnight. 
uh, all the contracts here in, in, in uh, Green Hills and at that time generally were fixed price contracts and contractors like ourselves were left to carry a very heavy burden uh, after these prices rose and we had no way of, of recuperating uh, the costs. Unfortunately, William Loudon and Sons, who had also won one of the contracts to build in Greenhills, couldn't ride out the storm. They, they went to liquidation and the, 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 the houses were left high and dry and of course my department had to go in and rescue the event, so we, we took them over and completed the houses. Exposure generally uh, was the cause of most of the problems with the weather, just uh, rain and wind. The wind disappointed, uh, uh, that's advantage they did have, have of course was because it was at the highest point in East Kilbride and you did have that um, southwest wind blowing over the Balak here, you know, but uh, it's fresh. <laughs> well, what can I say? Greenhills is famous for its weather. Being a couple of hundred feet above sea level, we do get extremes of weather here, and we're used to it. Like the Lake Privics before us, we're a hardy bunch in Greenhills, so the building work just carried on. The Greenhills area itself uh, was completed relatively quickly from a start in, in September 1971 uh, to our completion of it um, in uh, May of 1977. So it was a relatively short period. If my memory serves me right, we, in Green Hills, I think we built uh, 2,578 houses, and I think it was 521 flats, which we built in, the, in, in the, the, the Green Hills itself. Over the years, Green Hills has actually been home to quite a few famous residents, and one in particular remembers what it was like back in the early days. I came to Green Hills from Glasgow because their house got knocked down and I came when I was about 12 and a half, 13. So I do remember coming to this house and first of all I had my own room upstairs. There was a loo downstairs and there was a bath and I do remember thinking that's fantastic so I wouldn't have to go to the, the Ruby Street baths once a week which is what we used to do. Um, the garden was just clay, there was nothing there but I was very excited about having a garden which was fantastic. And I do remember my, my abiding memory is mud. Lots and lots of mud. I mean, me and my brother christened it Mud Hills because it was just terrible. I do remember walking back from school one time and actually getting bogged down. The mud souked my... I was trying to take a shot, which was wrong. And my shoes get caught in the mud. And when I lifted my foot, I lost my shoes. I moved to Green Hills about when I was six years old. Stayed here for about 16 years. Um, for me, it was my childhood and growing up. It was an age of innocence where you could play happily without your parents' control. The green fields were great, you had the forests and in the early stages you had the build building sites. So it was a great adventure to me and my friends that I made during that time. Following the blueprint of all the other districts of East Kilbride, a new shopping centre was planned for the community and the contract for this went to costing construction. So very soon a brand new shopping mall had been erected, with murals decorating the walls and traders moving in. Over the years, John Morrison the baker has supplied over 2.2 million pies, 12.4 million rolls, and next door, Alex McCandlish has supplied just under 19 million sausages to put in the rolls. Mm -mm. And just up the road, the Greenhouse pub has served over 1 million gallons of beer. That's 8 million pints, by the way. And John Fenton's The Chemist has supplied over 5 million aspirins for the hangovers that followed. Eventually, when things got better, shops appeared, you know, we got grass in the garden and lovely flowers, and it just all, it just all started to get built from, really, from nothing. And that's really all to do with the people that were there. New schools like Castlefield, Crosshouse, St Vincent's and Greenhills Primary Schools were also built. Then in following years, Ballarup and St Andrew's Secondaries were formed. Organisations like the Credit Union were started here in Greenhills and after starting off in a hut in the grounds of St Vincent's Primary School, they have now moved into brand new offices in the village of East Kilbride. In fact, this organisation, which still meets every Saturday at the Greenhouse Community Centre, now has an annual turnover of some three and a half million pounds. And like any new area, things like doctors and medical facilities were needed. Although Greenhills now does have its own dedicated health centre, the first doctor's surgeries were actually held here in Troon Court, where three houses were turned over to become a temporary surgery. 
churches, which are an important part of any community, also started off holding their services in houses and school halls until more permanent structures could be put in place. On the 28th of November 1974, the first sod of turf was cut here for the foundations of the Greenhills Parish Church. And after extensive building work, the Parish Church of St Andrews was built and very soon was contributing to the social life of the community as well as the spiritual side. So once again in 1975, very near the site of the High Point, people gathered. Only this time, not to dish out justice, but for their Sunday service. Also in 1975, the Methodist community opened their church. And as well as the church, they built a sheltered housing complex for older people. And this establishment is still there today and still provides a home for some of the residents who moved in back in 1975. The large Catholic community of Greenhills is also well served. On the September weekend of 1977, Father Martin O'Keefe cut into an area of land just beside St Vincent's Primary, which would kick off the building work for the Parish Church of St Vincent's. Due to bad weather, the construction work was held up and it was nearly two years later before the Catholic community could leave their services in St Vincent's Primary School Hall for the new parish church that they had built. It was now up to the people of Greenhills to make new friendships and form into a community. A group um, in 1999 was formed um, to try and commemorate the millennium in a way which would be suitable for the community. Um, so there was um, two or three ideas that came out of there. One was um, the, uh, the festival. Well, it started off with a, a, a parade which uh, started over at uh, Green Hills Primary School. And the parade was led by um, Scottish Pipers from Renfrew um, and followed by um, Majorettes and all the local dancers. Um, and then we went down to Ballarup School where the main stage was. Um, and then various activities were on there with action carts and things for the kids. We had Dee Hepburn, who is well known in East Kilbride in film circles. She came along um, and helped us uh, present the medals to the five-a-side school kids. Um, and it was a great day. And this is the sort of community spirit that existed right from the start in Greenhills. Parades like that had happened before. Back in the 70s, there was a gala day that had been filmed by local resident and filmmaker Rachel McCallum. This is just one example of what an active part the residents played here. Residents who wanted to make their mark on their new home. So, 30 years after the first sod was cut to start the building of Greenhills, this community has now taken root. People who moved here as children in the 70s or others that were born here since have now grown up and had families of their own. Their children now attend the same schools they did and the houses they were born in have become their own. And just as the people keep growing and changing, so does Greenhills. With the addition of new housing estates like Lindsay Field and new shopping facilities like Safeway, Greenhills is no longer the new community at the edge of the new town. The residents of Greenhills are no longer the incomers to East Kilbride or the Glasgow Overspill that were searching for a new beginning. Just as East Kilbride was once itself a fledgling new town that went on to prosper, Greenhills is now very much part of the fabric of that new town and its success. It's a healthy community in its own right, with a sense of its own identity, and now with a sense of the rich heritage that was here before. Well, I think I personally feel proud. I live in East Kilbride. Um, I drive through it all the time. There are certain points in East Kilbride where you simply cannot see a house that we did not build. Uh, and uh, yes, that makes me proud. As someone born in Brotham, East Kilbride, what it meant to me was the fields and somewhere to play on the bikes and come up and do things kids do at that point. And then, to see it all getting built, again, come up to have a look round. In fact, my folks come up and looked at a house in Greenhills. For some reason, we didn't decide to move. So my memory is of the green fields that Greenhills was before and then seeing the place grow and prosper. If you look at Greenhills now, there's lots of uh, laurel bushes going about and you know, plenty of trees and plenty of green spaces within the, the, the housing area itself which I think was tremendous. In a few words, it means community to me. I mean, I mean I've lived here for 25 years, and uh, I think it's an excellent community. There's a lot of things going here that don't go in the other areas of the town, unfortunately. I stayed in Greenhouse for a long time, and I'm really, I'm really fond of it. I've got really good memories, really good memories. It's when I made a lot of good friends, 
um, and had a lot of good times. Green Hill's an excellent area for me. It was the first time I've been elected as a councillor and I have a lot of thoughts for the people in Green Hills and I think this is a wonderful opportunity for the people of Green Hills to be involved in a community action and relationship within the community of Green Hills and East Kilbride. I think for me it really means people that have a real sense of community and, and often in new towns you hear people saying oh they're soulless, they're lifeless but when you come into Green Hills it's part of a new town, the people are just so warm, um, real sense of community, so much going on and probably since I moved to this area uh, I've had more great nights out in Green Hills than I've ever had anywhere else. <laughs> It's absolutely super. Well, as an elected member for part of Green Hills, I took over the, the, my area three years ago when I first moved to East Green Greenhills was at Fields. And now you look at it now, it's a bustling community, full of people, vibrant area, uh, great place to live. Uh, well, I really like it and I've got lots of friends here. The vast majority are easy, approachable and gen genuine people. Uh, hence, whenever there's a community event, so like gala days, etc., we get an excellent turnout. Uh, I obviously get many people at surgeries and I find them e easy to approach. You're always welcome when you go to your people's homes, uh, so I have no problems with them. I think they're very friendly. Uh, most of the people from Green Hills came from Glasgow, where I did. Uh, so it's an extension of where we came from originally. The difference is it was green fields, but now you Five minutes away from here, you can walk into the country. Great place to live. Green Hills is green. Green Hills means a lot to me because I've lived here for 15 years as the parish minister, so I've been involved in a whole lot of things that happen in the community. The church, of course, is right in the centre of the community, right beside the square, and our buildings are used on a Sunday for Sunday worship, but for all sorts of things during the week as well from the guides and the brownies to the women's club or the men's club and the pantomime and the Cayley players. Well, I used to live in Green Hills when they just built Green Hills at the very beginning. Moved away after about nine years, moved back into Glasgow and I moved back three years ago and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I just really enjoy living here. And as a wee fella says, it's nice and green. <laughs> In 1970, you didn't know what was ahead of it. You didn't know that in 10 years, the population of here would be 10, 11, 12,000. There would be 3,500 houses and flats. So you had this, always this um, pioneering um, spirit of developing a new area, building up the infrastructure, the schools, the shops, and all the, the leisure facilities that go to make a, 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 the vibrant community that I think Green Hills really is. I really do think we were pioneers, I really do think we were um, and I think that we've built a community from really from nothing. The best way for me to sum it up is that I came up here uh, from England in, 19, in 1974 and I came to live in this community in 75 and I would say to the rest of the community if they are enjoying their time as much as I have over my 20 odd years here um, what a wonderful, great community to live in, and I wouldn't swap it for the world. When you look around now, it's fantastic. It really is Green Hills. It's, it's not Mud Hills anymore. So if you're watching this video in the year 2003, or even the year 3003, we are just some of the people who lived in Green Hills at this time. This is our community as it is now, and a little bit of what went before us. What the future holds is up to you.